Welcome. Uh, this is the Scripture Ministry Interview Series. My name is Hans Matawemi. I'm the Managing Director of the Henry Center. And next to me is Pastor Steve Farish. He's pastor of Crossroads Church in Grace Lake, right. Illinois. Okay. And um, with us today is uh, Dr. Timothy Laniak from uh, uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, Charlotte campus, where he is the academic dean and professor of the Old Testament. Thanks for being with us today. Sure. We're really to de delighted that you're here and we really enjoyed your lecture yesterday. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, our viewers to be aware of two excellent books. Uh, one of them is more academic. Um, it's called Shepherds After My Own Heart, Pastoral Traditions and Leadership in the Bible. And it's, um, it's in uh, the New Studies in Biblical Theology series uh, and looks at the shepherd metaphor uh, really through the whole of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And then there's a, a, a more pastoral and accessible um, um, book uh, that came later, right? Uh, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks, 40 Daily Reflections on Biblical Leadership. And, um, and this is an excellent book for pastors and ministry professionals and workers. And uh, we highly recommend uh, both these books. Uh, the the uh, academic book is published by IVP, and the um, the other book is published by a Shepherd Leader Publications. That's right, Shepherd Leader Publications. I think I'll give the first question to Steve to get things started. Well, thank you, Hans, very much, and Dr. <coughs> Laniak, thank you for your lecture yesterday. It was, I thought, immensely helpful. Uh, especially to those of us who ply our trade daily in pastoral ministry. So thank you, thank you for your writing. I also want, wondered if you could say a few words about the website, shepherdleader.com, mm -hmm. uh, and offer those who will be viewing this interview, a number of whom will be pastors, mm -hmm. uh, some information about what's available at that site. Sure. Um, might help just to to give a history that led okay. to um, the books and the website because I, I did research in the Middle East, um, doing research among Bedouin shepherds and doing research exegetically and in the ancient Near East to understand the pastoral image that really pervades the understanding of leadership throughout all kinds of civilizations, including biblical ones. Um, and out of that came the first silver book, um, Shepherds After My Own Heart, and um, I came back to this country and I started doing conferences and seminars like the ones that we did yesterday using images that I had from some of my interviewing time with shepherds. And I realized that the, um, the ethnic and cultural dimensions to shepherding was, was of great interest to people and it provided a great hook for people to think more concretely about what I had written about in more compressed uh, <coughs> summary form. And so I expanded it into um, an illustrated journey that's almost like a seminar stretched out over 40 days of personal reading. Um, but the goal was really to create a learning community of people that were in different kinds of leadership who wanted to share their thoughts together. And usually when we do a seminar like we did yesterday, there's the Q&A and the after discussion, which is really when people start to, to face the issues that are most pressing for them, whether it's discipline or whether it's how to get people, you know, immersed in God's Word in a culture that's giving them lots of other substitutes, etc. And so I ended up viewing the illustrated book as a book without a backside, so to speak, that's open to discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I end every chapter, they're brief chapters, they're all illustrated, and they start with, uh, with an icon with sandals, uh, I'm sorry, with a uh, staff, which is sort of looking at the ethnography of the life of shepherds in one aspect. And then there's an icon of a scroll which moves people to scripture and scripture is illuminated in light of the pastoral background. And then there's an icon of sandals where people move into their lives. And I'm trying to give people some questions and guidance to think about their leadership in a variety of settings. Uh, the local church is a primary one, but the family is also a primary one people that are teachers, people that are missionaries, people that are counselors, people that are mentors, coaches, etc. And so I'm, I'm just starting to ask questions as each chapter ends, and the questions are usually helping people to think about how God has been 
uh, leading them as a shepherd and how they might reflect that in all of these different ways. There's 13 chapters each on provision, protection, and guidance. Well, the conversations that get started have no place to go, or they had no place to go except in a conference until I created the website, and the website actually has a forum for each one of the chapters, and it also has general forums for each of the two books. And right now I'm just having some, I have a couple of uh, research assistants that are just going through the data to do some thematic searches and to try to compile it so that we can do a study guide that really takes some of the comments that people have been making mm. and start to integrate that into another form of extended conversation beyond the book. And I'm also, so at shepherdleader.com people can, they can buy the book, they can buy the images that are in the book, they can uh, get some free downloads of study guides that different people have put together. And I'll eventually have a, uh, over the course of this year, a DVD series that has some of the interviews um, in high definition for people to be able to kind of join me in the tent and, and actually be able, in a sense, to, to jump inside uh, that setting where the questions were first asked and to have that be a part of the conversation that's, uh, that's hyperlinked at the website. Mm -hmm. So is that with you and a shepherd and a translator, that kind right. of setting? Okay. Right. So okay. there's a couple of different years when I did some filming, okay. mostly in Jordan, and a lot of that's uh, being coordinated around the feedback that I get and also around the discussions that seem to be the most mm -hmm. interesting. So mm. certain topics have become um, not only prominent in the Bible, uh, and they match what's significant in the lives of shepherds, uh, but they're also significant in the, in the lives of spiritual shepherds too. So mm -hmm. once we get that electrical current in place, we want to have a study guide and some DVDs too. Mm. Wow, that's excellent. If I may <clears throat> borrow this, the, uh, the lecture yesterday, as you said, was, was based more on the While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks book. If I may, though, I'd like to ask a question about the Shepherds After My Own Heart book, which I read uh, when it first came out and profited from immensely and would recommend to all the viewing audience. I really would. What I think um, I especially appreciated was your highlighting of some of the Old Testament passages with the shepherd metaphor that we don't ordinarily turn to first. When I think of the shepherding metaphor in the Old Testament, automatically I go to Psalm 23. <laughs> of course, the mm -hmm. Lord is my shepherd. But you highlighted Jeremiah 23 and especially Ezekiel 34. Mm -hmm. And you did such a good job with the the exegesis, I think, of those passages. Could you just say a few words about those two passages and how they contribute to the overall shepherding metaphor mm -hmm. in Scripture? Yeah, sure. Well, certainly the, the two books have two different purposes. Um, and the one that's an exegetical journey through the Bible, I hope, uh, I hope the viewers um, have the interest and the stamina to go through it because the, if you trace the shepherding theme through the Bible and you start to recognize that there's a kind of meta-narrative that runs through the whole Bible to which all of these shepherding passages seem to be linked, then rather than having these atomized uh, kind of insights that you might get like, say, a, a Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller, you know, you, yeah, you can yeah. kind of have a journey through one passage um, but if you go through the whole Bible and you realize that almost from beginning to end, God's role as a shepherd over his people and the role of his leaders as under shepherds, we might say, or as, as uh, shepherds who work in the family business, as I like to say, that's something that sh shows up in the most extended form in Ezekiel 34, who followed on the heels of Jeremiah. And a lot of his messages really do amplify those of Jeremiah. But these are two prophets that we know as exilic prophets. And the, the significance of that uh, begins with the fact that the, the prophets, as they were moving towards the exile, were starting to already predict that Israel would, as God's people, move back into a kind of space that resembled the wilderness where God had first met them. So Jeremiah was already saying, 
you know, I betrothed you, Jeremiah 2, 2. You know, the, this right. was the, the right. land of your betrothal. It was a wild wilderness, but that was the place where God proposed to his people. And it's in that setting where he could most dramatically provide for them, protect them, and guide them. Just, it's, it's just so obvious that he wanted them to be in a barren landscape that was inhospitable and hostile so that he could show them that they could trust him. And in that setting, he proposed to them and gave them the covenant. So when the prophets were facing the exile, they were giving words of judgment coupled with words of hope that said, when you go into exile, you're going to face the barren, kind of uh, symbolically barren world of being without a king, without a country, without a temple, temple. without an identity, and God is going to reform you. And all of that re-language of renewal and reformation and recreation, a lot of that shows up in these prophets, and they're bringing back to play in Israel's imagination, their theological imagination, everything that happened in the wilderness in the first place. And what's so exciting is to get into the Gospels and to realize that Jesus in his own ministry is also, like the exilic prophets, predicting the destruction of the temple. And whether or not he's saying it, he's standing in his ministry just prior to the end of the temple period this time the second temple period, and he knows that he's dealing with people who are still in a spiritual exile, waiting for a rebuilding of the nation, waiting for a rebuilding of the community. And even though they've had over five centuries with a temple, this is a period of time when Jesus is ministering to people who need to understand the God they once knew apart from a state, apart from a king. And so that, that narrative arc runs through the whole Bible and it gets you all the way into Revelation where of all things, the great city of Jerusalem is also characterized as this kind of Edenic paradise in a wilderness where Jesus is not only a king, the Lion of Judah, but he's the shepherd and the lamb in Revelation 7 who's serving his people. So I, Ezekiel is the, the most expansive metaphor uh, or parable about shepherd leadership where it's an indictment on Israel's leadership for not being faithful as shepherds and where God promises himself to come rescue his people right. and to appoint David again to rule them. And of course, all this is prophetic for Jesus' ministry and some of what gets laid out in that prophetic vision just carries you right through the whole New Testament. And in fact, it sits underneath the parable of the lost sheep. It sits underneath John 10, the parable of the good shepherd it's, it's hard for me to believe that Ezekiel 34 wasn't the primary text sitting underneath it and Jeremiah sitting underneath Ezekiel. I wonder, um, just, I mean, in, in your journey, did you, were you thinking, okay, I'm just going to study uh, shepherds in the ancient Near Eastern context, and then you suddenly saw all these wonderful connections, or... Or did you did, did that emerge after as you were doing your studies, or did you sort of have the an inkling that there was something there, and that led you to do that work? Um, I started teaching in a seminary setting uh, full time about 14 years ago, and of course, seminary you could say is leadership development for the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. People talk about being pastors and shepherds regularly. Uh, I'd say back in the 90s, it was a lot more common to talk about servant leadership if people were going to talk about leadership with a hyphen. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, that's our work, is to help shape people for that. But we, um, we were involved in a grant that gave us uh, a chance to work with a number of different seminaries on leadership development. And I came face to face with the reality that a lot of, uh, a lot of leaders in seminaries, particularly presidents, really didn't have good biblical resources for thinking about leadership. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's when I came to realize that there was a field of leadership that was just mushrooming, and for the most part it was being generated out of the corporate Secular, world, yeah. and then a lot of it was being filtered uh, by Christian writers, but if you read the footnotes or if you could read uh, with knowledge, you'd know what was underneath it was really stuff that had been published by people that were corporate mm -hmm. leaders. And, of course, all truth is God's truth. There's lots of good wisdom out there, just like there is in the Proverbs. Right. But what struck me as a Bible scholar and as somebody working with pastors was that the Bible had so many references to shepherds throughout that if you were going to start anywhere understanding 
what the Bible says about leadership. And that became sort of my, my own pressing question is, mm -hmm. what does the Bible say about leadership? Mm -hmm. And I started by writing kind of a summary, a uh, survey of biblical leadership for this. Uh, we had a three-year grant with Lilly to work with seminary presidents. And mm -hmm. uh, through that time, we had a number of different research projects. And I wrote a summary, just about a 40-page summary and we followed and we used as our kind of uh, rubric for that Jeremiah 3.15. I'll give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. The idea of calling, character, and competence were sort of all put together in the general circle of community. That became kind of a rubric for the, mm -hmm. for the time. So then I thought, well, I have a sabbatical that I want to do some more research on this, but of course, there's, there's probably dozens of books available for pastors, maybe hundreds, on being shepherds. Mm -hmm. And being familiar with a book like A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 or A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 10 by Philip Keller, I thought, well, I know there's devotional stuff out there on shepherding, but surely there must be material available for people to think about being sh uh, pastors. I mean, pastoral theology must. And I spent a year uh, doing two things prior to my sabbatical. One of them was studying metaphor, uh, which I discovered was sort of in every discipline with its own language. And the second thing was I was doing research on, on uh, pastoral theology or resources for pastors that use shepherding. And to my surprise, everything I found was a Ph.D. or a demon thesis. And it would be, say, the shepherd warrior and, uh, you know, is Zechariah, or it would be an extended... Um, thesis on Ezekiel 34 or the use of Ezekiel 34 in John 10 or it'd be an extensive discussion of John 10. But I couldn't find anything uh, that was exegetically grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I found some resources in pastoral uh, ministry that had the name in them. So there's books like uh, They Smell Like Sheep or Escape from Church Incorporated actually has some, um, you know, some sustained reflection on, on shepherding. Um, there were some other books put out by the Leadership Network, Designed for Christian Leaders. One of them is on, you know, called Shepherd Leadership. Another one's uh, kind of rooted in Psalm 23, sort of a Christian business person's reflection. But I guess I'm still kind of, after all these years, still in shock. Mm -hmm. uh, 2,000 years with the church as an interpretive community with its central leadership role being nothing other than a shepherd um, in terms of the language used mm -hmm. and no sustained exegetical journey through the Bible to put that in some kind of um, perspective for people that spend their lives in pastoral ministry. Mm. So then that became um, a, a vacuum that I felt compelled to fill. Right. right. In your talk yesterday, um, one of the interesting things you said was... Um, uh, you noted that uh, pastors and lay people tend to think of when they think about the shepherd, they have certain assumptions, and yeah. you then proceeded to um, dismantle some of them. I wonder if you could kind of yeah. revisit that topic for us here. Yeah, I think any group I've been to, if I said, what, what comes to mind when I say people are like sheep? Inevitably, the answer is they're dumb. Yeah. And I never, never saw that anywhere in Scripture. Mm-hmm. I don't find shepherds treating their animals like they're dumb. Um, certainly goats uh, are more independent, have a mind of their own. Sheep tend to flock. They tend to move as a group. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain it's kind of salient characteristics about the animals that are actually part of the way the metaphor plays itself out in the Bible because mm -hmm. uh, the bucks and the rams are sometimes viewed as sub-shepherds. You know, they have leadership qualities. The, the rams... Uh, and the bucks and the goats are sometimes that way because they, they're more independent, they're larger, they're stronger, mm -hmm. and uh, usually a flock has a much larger number of ewes that are kind of uh, corralled a little bit by these others that are on the edges of the flock. Um, so uh, that, that may go a little bit towards mm -hmm. uh, one of the misconceptions. Um, I think another one is that uh, I've heard shepherding is irrelevant so it's not so much a misperception about the realities of shepherding, but mm -hmm. that the metaphor itself maybe had, had become obsolete for us. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, maybe it's just as fine that we use the word pastor, which is just the word shepherd, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in a different language, mm -hmm. uh, or even leader, because people are, uh, in many cases, removed from an agrarian type setting or a pastoralist right. setting. Right. And when I did the research, I was actually open to thinking as a missionary translator in terms of dynamic equivalence. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to think about something that works in our world like Shepherd does. Mm -hmm. Does coach work? Does CEO work? I mean, I was open to whatever right. it was. Right. And in just a brief kind of epilogue in that, uh, that silver book, Shepherds After My Own Heart, I just said, I don't think you can manage to accomplish what this hmm. metaphor does. Um, what it holds together is everything that pastoral ministry includes. Mm -hmm. And the only other kind of radically comprehensive and integrated image would be parent. Hmm. So I think people have misperceptions about shepherding mm -hmm. and about sheep. I think one of the other misperceptions they have about shepherding is usually that uh, people think of it in terms of one or another uh, dimension of it. So they sometimes think of it in terms of the nurturing side exclusively right, right. or the heavy-handed authoritarian uh, high accountability side, which, which people have named shepherding groups uh, and sometimes in those groups that's been the characteristic kind of leadership. Right. So and you want, you're wanting to say that a, sh a true shepherd has both yeah. dimensions. Uh, right. Uh, one, one passage that I, I love to use uh, after we think about the kind of, uh, you could say, the, the soft side and the hard side yeah. or the, the, uh, the compassionate heart and the courageous heart, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even what I might say is the shepherd of the day and the shepherd of the night, mm -hmm. um, is when Paul talked to the Corinthians and he said, you know, he, because Paul was often referring to his visits, which were sometimes postponed, he wanted them to get things right. And he mm -hmm. said, I would like to come to you with a spirit of gentleness, but I will come to you with a rod. I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but he's basically saying, you know me well enough to know I can go both ways. Mm -hmm. mm. And as a good pastor, as a good shepherd, Paul was saying, my preference is always to be nurturing, but I will not hesitate to use the rod. Mm -hmm. And Paul used nurturing language to the extent of considering himself a midwife. He, he, midwife, he used maternal imagery. Mm -hmm. It's very suited to shepherding right. leadership. But all the language about discipline, handing people over to Satan, mm -hmm. it is very much, it is as much a part of shepherding. Mm -hmm. And I think what's difficult for us is that our own temperaments, our own cultures, our own institutional settings sometimes make us uh, prefer one side uh, to the other. Mm -hmm. And ironically, uh, meanwhile, as parents, we all realize that our, to raise our children well, they need to know that we're there for them. Mm -hmm. Our presence represents our comforting, nurturing, mm -hmm. you know, sustaining presence. We're looking out for their best interests. Mm -hmm. But if that's not coupled with discipline, it's, a, it's poor parenting. Right. And, and just to add to that analogy, if two parents decide that one of them will be the disciplinarian and one of them will be the nurturer, you can manage to get the work done of raising children but the children don't get the benefit of people who have a fuller, more integrated expression of love that has a disciplinary dimension to it, or you could say discipline that has a loving dimension to it. Because as we know theologically, if, if you think about justice or order or discipline apart from love and mercy, it's not as though it's a purer form of it. It actually becomes uh, an extreme and distorted, caricatured form of it. Just like love that is pure sympathy, pity, mm -hmm. and compassion, mm -hmm. without backbone, is a poorer form of it, not a purer yeah. form. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think there's a theological reason why these need to be held together. And again, that's just one of the reasons why I wouldn't want to abandon a metaphor that requires a little cultural competence to use. Right. I'd rather get us acquainted with something that the Bible just never gets away from because it keeps those things together. Right. Yeah, the, um, it, it was very helpful in the lecture yesterday when you you used the, the shepherding metaphor and you talked about pastoral ministry as compassionate provision, courageous protection, and competent guidance. And I, I think under there of the, well, let me ask you this question. 
what do you see as the main pastoral duties that fall under those three categories, recognizing, of course, that they'll overlap necessarily. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question, sure. if I may. Yeah. Well, the, I was kind of uh, forced to think about the specifics of that when I organized the provision protection guidance um, rubric for the second book on mm -hmm. this topic because there, there are some topics that you can sort of think, well, which way do they go? But from my own uh, interviewing, I wanted the, the life and work of shepherding to kind of drive my understanding of it and not my own preconceptions and not even necessarily to let the Bible uh, skew what my understanding is of shepherding. Okay, so I, I want the Bible to be the authority for leadership, but I want shepherding to stand on its own two four legs maybe we should say right <laughs> but so when the bible talks about feeding it's it's really a providing kind of uh task when it talks about retrieving the lost so if you read in ezekiel 34 god said you know you didn't bandage the ones that were sick or uh bruised you didn't search for the ones that were lost you, they, they were wandering on the hillsides. Nobody was looking for them. And, and so he, God said, I'll bring them back and I'll pasture them. I'll heal them. Th these are functions that are clearly symbolic and they're figurative about the life of leadership in a community that when people have their needs met, when they come for prayer, for healing, when they come for with their needs to be taught, to be led, all these are provision. Under protection, there's some obvious ones that have to do with discipline within and justice without. And again, Ezekiel 34 matches the realities on the field when you kind of go from daytime activities that are more nurturing to let's get ready to face the predators of the night. It's kind of obvious that there are, there are wolves and hyenas and false teachers, uh, again, figuratively. These are, these are the threats to the community that are in the environment so what we do to protect can include everything from filters on an internet, uh, you know, on a station in a church to, you know, security guards in a very physical way, just like serving people physical food is complemented by giving them spiritual food and it points to that. Mm -hmm. In the same way, what we do to protect people in terms of making sure they understand what the dangers are from certain teachings as well as certain kinds of predatorial behavior that's a bit that's, that's sort of prowling outside in their culture. Those are protective functions. Ezekiel does, does something pretty dramatic when he says, when God, quoting God, he says, I'll, I'll bring you back to the land. Where, I'll bring you back from where you've been scattered and you've been food for the wild animals. And then he just turns and says, and then I will judge you. And I will separate the fat from the lean and I will separate the ones that with their shoulders are butting yeah. the others. Mm -hmm. And his, his point is, I'm not going to rescue you from the hostility and the, the threats outside only to have you devour each other. And I'd say that uh, discipline inside the church, which is about keeping equity and order and justice inside, is simply another expression of the concern to protect the flock from the outside predators. And even, you could say, like Paul did in Acts 20, there are wolves outside, but there are also wolves in sheep's clothing within. And so the, the threats are not simply ones that are sort of outside the boundaries of the building or the church membership. So it's a natural expression of that kind of protective one. And then when it came to guidance, I used that as a, a little bit more of a catch-all category for the for the goals of shepherding that seem to be so uh, obvious in the world of shepherds, namely making sure that people grow and when they grow, they reproduce. The, the fruits, the gifts of the Spirit thriving in an environment, what, what, whatever we do for that, if we have small group ministries, if we have uh, assessments for people's gifting, if we do kind of a 360 evaluation of somebody mm -hmm. in a staff position, are we intent on having them grow? Those are very theological, very biblical, very pastoral things to do, to be looking for ways for people to thrive with the assumption that when people thrive, they reproduce. And then uh, anything to do with vision, moving people through the wilderness, 
um, what what struck me especially was that um, the 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 contemporary conversation about vision casting and planning is often seen to get people out of the ambiguity of a visionless present into some kind of missional directed focus and as good as that is and important as that is I saw the Bible really providing a much bigger horizon for vision casting that always locates people on an eschatological kind of trajectory heading towards heaven and I'd say before we uh, uh, obsess on getting ourselves, or I, I guess along with making sure that we get ourselves out of a, an ambiguous present into a five-year plan that, that we, by the way, we read um, after it's written, which is always a problem too. Sometimes planning becomes an end in itself. But after mm-hmm. we do that, are we, are we making sure that that's in alignment with a much longer-term vision that God has for his community as a whole? But all of those tasks that have to do with looking forward to moving people, they, they all fit under that idea of guidance. And they're obviously the kind of tasks that show up in the pastoral epistles when you actually get right down to what, it, what is it that people are doing. Or really in all the epistles, when you look at Paul's work, he's trying to get people to uh, move ahead in a way that is, uh, he's, he's providing for them, he's protecting them, and he's also providing guidance for them. So I'd say there's some tasks that, uh, that overlap. You, you could, in a given sermon, serve all three of those mm-hmm, ends. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't reduce them uh, exclusively task to topic. But, uh, and that, just one more footnote, that sort of uh, takes us back to the, uh, the reality that, that being a shepherd is a multimodal, complex role set that requires you to be able to swivel well and know that in any given occasion you may be accomplishing more than one thing. So it could be that you're having an anniversary dinner in a church and you are summarizing the history of the church to this point and in that process you're feeding people in certain ways, you're providing guidance in certain ways and you're also reminding them of the boundaries that keep the environment safe and secure. And, and this is the follow-up question. You, you, you touched on this a little bit in the lecture yesterday, a little bit in the question and answer session. But as pastors, all of us have certain giftedness from the Lord. All of us feel stronger in certain areas than others. I and a number of the pastors I know feel like the Lord has gifted us, for example, in, say, uh, preaching and classic pastoral care and even in the ability to conduct discipline but we feel like we fall so very short in the sort of visionary leadership Mm -hmm. category so what do you say to a to every pastor who knows that he's not gifted in every area Mm -hmm. of shepherding ministry uh, and what do you say to the, the governing board the board of elders who's around that pastor? Yeah. It's a great question. Back in the 90s, Leadership Journal uh, ran a series that uh, was headed by the the question, what does the church need most, shepherds or leaders? Mm -hmm. And I wish they would run it again so that we could say yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because at the time that it was framed, the, the debate was an either-or approach. And I'd say absolutely the church needs shepherds, including shepherds who are gifted in the ways that you've described and in the ways that you feel like characteristically uh, many pastors aren't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want those tasks to drift outside of the role of shepherd. But obviously we're gifted differently what, what I'm encouraging, I think, just from my experience with Scripture and listening to shepherds who presume that when, whatever work needs to be done, you do it. You know, so there, was, there wasn't anything of the American specialization uh, or what I would call a union mentality, which is the dark side of, of this. G- gifting is a biblical notion. The plurality of gifts and the plurality of leadership, that's biblical. 
But I think we should be aware that in the United States especially, we, we have really exalted specialization to a point where it has uh, become viral in our thinking. And so mm. sometimes when we think about, when we think we th that we are thinking about gifting, sometimes what we are caught up in is what we might find true in a medical hospital. You know, people just find themselves uh, increasingly specialized to the point where we lack for the generalists. And I think that part of what I uh, appreciate so much about the pastor as a, in a biblical sense, a pastor is that kind of person who really does uh, engage in everything from what I call the bedside to the boardroom. It's, it, there's counseling, there's oversight, etc. Now, there's something else in our culture that feeds uh, a misperception, and that is we, we love superstars, and there's plenty of Messiah types that are in pulpits and running churches. And so uh, there's a biblical doctrine of gifting which we shouldn't sort of run in one direction to specialization and hide from some things that are important for us to do. They need to be done, and sometimes they need to be done by by a person who has oversight in several domains. But we also have to be careful that we don't run to the other extreme and say, uh, everything has to be run by me, one single person who does it all, who knows it all, and who's the expert in everything. And, and that sets up just an incredible burden on pastors when they feel like that's what's expected. So I think sharing leadership in a way that appreciates gifts but doesn't go into the dark side you know, mm. on, on you know, there's always a precipice on these things. Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. But I, but I, 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 I mentioned yesterday a trend that just it's it's always disturbed me that that when a pastor sort of goes from usually being a, a caring person into training to be a pastor, you get more training usually in the areas of of teaching and counseling, and less in the areas of business and and development, branding, marketing, all these things that. And, and, and you get to a certain point when you feel like, well, we don't know who we are as a, as a congregation. We don't know where we're going, and I don't feel quite as equipped. We, we sometimes look at people in the business, you know, our, our Christian leaders in our churches who are in the business world, and they're sharper and more defined in those areas. And sometimes we quickly say, well, that's their gifting. And then we kind of pull them up alongside of us, and we say, uh, now we've got the perfect complement. And I'm not sure that we, uh, maybe we might have stopped short in thinking about what we could get training in. We don't all need to have an MBA as pastors, but we certainly could do better in some areas with a little bit of training. In fact, before we had a seminary degree, we couldn't do a very good sermon. And it took a long time to do exegesis and homiletics. And I think we maybe sell ourselves short about our capacity to do things. There's a, there's a pretty deep inferiority complex with respect to the business of ministry. So I, I hope we can get over that without becoming messianic about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can also embrace people that have other expertise in ways that don't demean those. Uh, in fact, I would rather elevate them to the level of biblical shepherding. But they do have to go through a theological filter. Mm -hmm. Someone who's a successful business person isn't automatically a great shepherd in a church because they have skills that some of us don't. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, I mean, what if a pastor says, he's hearing everything you're saying and, um, and, and clicking, but just the reality of, you know, living in a modernized world and in the 21st century and just the, the, as you talked about yesterday, some of the distractions and just the, the busyness and, and, um, you know, hearing you say that perhaps we should, you know, try and um, use some of these other capacities and not delegate, I guess, might, might, might seem intimidating. Just, you know, I'm just trying to survive as it is. Um, uh, I mean, do you have any words, words of count? I mean, that's a sort of big question, but, you know, I, I could see a pastor sort of struggling with that. Yeah. Well, maybe I... If you hadn't asked the question, I could have easily been misunderstood. Oh, okay. I think delegating is great. <clears throat> right. I think the multiplicity of gifts is what people coming into a congregation ought to recognize right away. Mm -hmm. This place isn't run by one person. Mm -hmm. This place is a place where we all thrive, 
and where sheep become shepherds. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's the flow on First Peter five. I, he says, "I want you to be models to the to the flock." Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's where the metaphor happily breaks down. Mm -hmm. Sheep don't become shepherds in the real world, but mm -hmm. they do in the church, and that's what mm -hmm. you want. You want that kind of environment. I, I'm. This is a nuanced conversation, obviously, right. Right. and I'm I'm, I'm just. There's so many scenarios that we all have in our minds, and it's so easy yeah. to be misunderstood because one person's scenario is in their mind when I have a different one in my mind. Right. Right. Delegation is great when it is done in a setting that's celebrating gifts. One of the, one of the ways that delegation can become... Uh, well, I, I guess, I'll, again, I'll say sort of the dark side of delegation is that it's abdication. If, if what we're really doing, uh, if, we, if we tell people, and I hear this all the time, I have people say to me on, on one side of the authority equation, I've set people free in ministry. You know, we've got satellite churches and we've got all these different things, and different ministries and initiatives, and you know, the person tells me, I've really set these people free and they're growing and thriving. And then the person they talk to might be one of our students, and they come to me and they say, I've been left alone. I mean, I'm just... I, I, I don't have any access to the pastor because, uh, you know, they just, they just dumped this on me, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, mm -hmm. delegation is just a sensitive thing. Mm -hmm. If it looks like you're just offloading, right. it doesn't go over well. <laughs> but people love to be empowered with, uh, with a measure of, of thoughtful attentiveness to their growth without micromanaging, but rather, how can I help you grow more? What resources do you need? What can I do from my position, uh, perhaps, that helps you thrive more? What's your vision so that I can integrate it into the vision that I hear from other areas of the, the congregation or community? Mm -hmm. So I think that's just another piece of the conversation about multiple gifting. And again, it helps to reinforce the role of shepherd or shepherds in a congregation who have general oversight. Um, so rather than saying they have to do everything, it's more a matter of making sure that there's some people that are in touch with everything and they're attentive to what God is doing through people that are gifted and who express leadership in maybe more narrow venues. Mm -hmm. But if the people that have the general oversight are trying to get themselves into specializations, mm -hmm. then I wonder if we lack that kind of general oversight. Mm -hmm. If, and another scenario, if those that have general oversight say, well, I've lost touch with everybody. I, I watched a pastor say to a congregation with several thousand people, don't call me pastor anymore. I'm not. He said, I, I lead this congregation, but he said, look, it's your small group leaders, etc." I heard another pastor say, I'm not a shepherd, I'm a rancher. And that's a pretty common phrase people use too. You know, if Hammurabi could say about a whole kingdom, I'm the shepherd, if every ancient Near Eastern king was calling himself a shepherd, mm -hmm. from Egypt to Ur, right? I mean, they all said mm -hmm. shepherd. Mm -hmm. They weren't afraid to use the word shepherd for tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And in fact, there were even shepherds who oversaw flocks with tens and hundreds of thousands of animals. Right. So, I don't, you know, I don't think it helps to say, well, once I'm right. there. So. Just one little piece of advice that I think may help some pastors when you manage a large congregation, and that is um, if your involvement in the whole, which is at the point where it can't be comprehensive, uh, you can't touch every person, you can't right. know every person, right. but if your involvement at least can categorically cover the congregation as a whole, in other words, some counseling, some right. oversight, some teaching and preaching, uh, some administration, if there's a way to have that, then I think that those involvements can be selective, selectively individual mm -hmm. and symbolically comprehensive. So I had a pastor who said, you know, our church is big enough, I don't need to, counsel, I don't need to be doing counseling. And he said, I'm a lousy counselor. So I was happy when we could start a counseling program and have a counselor on board. But he said, I still counsel two hours a week, every Thursday afternoon. I'm still lousy. 
I'm trying to get better. Right. But he said, if I don't at least have some contact with yeah. people in That's that right. kind of setting, right. then I'm going to lose touch. Right. I don't want to have it all filtered. I don't want to have all of what I know about the person who leads of the congregation filtered through the person who's in charge of that. Right. And when a church gets to the point when budget time is just fighting over a limited pie, then it would seem as though we have been co-opted by specialization and there aren't generalists right. who have the oversight to say, if we integrate the visions that are happening in this church, here's how this vision overlaps with that and here's how we can marshal limited resources to serve all those visions. It doesn't mean that people don't have to tighten their belts and all, but if you get to the point when people are out of touch with one aspect or another or maybe all aspects of the church on the ground because mm -hmm. they're at too high a level, then I wonder, well, how could you say, well, now I can do the main thing, which is preaching? Well, mm -hmm. who, who are you preaching to? People right. that you've only gotten reports about. Mm. So you can't, I mean, mm. it's a matter of being realistic, right. but I still say, again, when churches get to be a couple thousand, there's a lot of pastors who who say, I remember the day when up until it was 150, 200, I knew everybody. Even, right. you know, you could visit in a church with 150, 200 people. If you're really aggressive, you could visit people in a cycle and say, I've even been in their homes every right. one, two or three years. I, I make it my point. And, but when you, let, when you start to let go of that, you can let go and sort of head into one direction and say, well, this is the one thing I'll do. Or you could say, well, let me keep my hand in these so that when someone else has given me a report, I still know what that's like. And ideally, the people that are in those areas can respect your commitment to that. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why I think sometimes it's good when a church can grow with you as a pastor, because when you let certain things go, and hopefully you have the ability to let them go without, without abdicating and without micromanaging, but when you let things go, your heart's still there. It doesn't, doesn't dry up over it. So it's good to wish you could do more of mm -hmm. everything. Have healthy boundaries that keep you from trying to do more than you should. But it's sort of that longing that keeps you, I think, yeah. in touch, right? Yeah. Does that resonate with you as that a That does resonate. Time? That's that's yeah, that's good. That's helpful. I think we're at our time, hands. Yeah. Thanks for joining us.